Amanda Catherine Colley was born to parents James Thomas Cloninger and Judy Roberson on June 3, 1979 in Orlando, Florida. In 1997, she graduated from Charlton County High School and then earned a degree from Valdosta State University. She was described as a kind, social, and confident individual. In late summer 2015, Amanda was living in St. Augustine, Florida with her husband of eight years, James Terry Colley Jr., and their two young children. Unfortunately, their marriage was very rocky and James was unhappy with Amanda's social life. As time went on, his drinking worsened and he became very controlling. When his alcohol abuse and reckless behavior became too much for Amanda and the kids, she decided it was time to separate. She filed for divorce, which upset James, and eventually led to her getting a restraining order against him. Once he moved out, it was finally time for Amanda to move on with her life, but little did she know that James would never truly let go. After he moved into his own place, he began talking with Amanda's neighbors and asked them to inform him if she brought anyone into the home, basically referring to romantic partners. He was also bombarding her with jealous and hostile text messages, which was against the restraining order. She eventually met a man by the name of Lamar Doberly, and the two began dating. One day, Lamar was out mowing her lawn when a neighbor saw him and took a photo. He then sent the photo to James. I seriously can't believe a neighbor would willingly do this for someone. He sent the neighbor a message back that read, and I quote, she's a cheating whore, she will pay. He also began angrily texting Amanda, asking her who the man was. Unfortunately, on August 27th, 2015, his anger would boil over to the point of no return. That morning, a very intoxicated and angry James broke into Amanda's home. He began ransacking the home and eventually found some of Lamar's clothes. He then tried calling Amanda but got her voicemail. After leaving a nasty message, he headed to a court hearing for violating the restraining order. Since the judge was unaware of what James had just done, he sentenced him to anger management classes and 12 months of unsupervised probation. After court, he called Amanda again, who had since discovered the state of her home. This time, she answered his call, most likely in an attempt to either defuse the situation or find out why he had just destroyed her home. However, after a 14-minute call, James hung up, skipped work, drove to a local convenience store, and bought some beer. Meanwhile, Amanda was upset about him destroying her home and called the police. When they arrived, she had a change of heart and decided not to press charges because she didn't want to make the kids' lives worse. After the officers left, Amanda cleaned up her house and invited over Lamar and two other good friends, Lindy Dobbins and Rachel Hendricks. James, now drunk and still fuming, arrived at her home and parked behind the house. He then began firing bullets at the home, which caught Amanda and her friends off guard. Lamar was able to escape first and sprinted down the road to get help. Amanda and her two other friends rushed into the master bedroom's closet and closed the door. Rachel pushed herself against the door to keep James from opening it while Lindy called 911. During that call, he could be heard screaming, where is he at? He also continued firing his gun while Amanda was screaming at him to stop. One of his shots went through the closet door and grazed Rachel. He eventually got the door open, rushed in, and shot Lindy and Amanda while Rachel hid behind the door. Once inside, she was able to escape. Rachel made it to a neighbor's home and called 911 to tell them her friends were now dead. While officers rushed to the scene, James left and called his father to tell him what he had just done. He said on the call, I done what I had to do. He then went by his sisters, grabbed a few items, and fled in his car heading north. He was finally caught and arrested in Virginia after a woman reported that he was irate and trying to run her off the road. When he was brought in for questioning, he immediately lawyered up. During his trial, he tried to blame his actions on Amanda's cheating, the alcohol, and the Ambien he took. However, the jury wasn't buying it and found him guilty of first-degree premeditated murder on July 18, 2018, for the deaths of both Amanda and Lindy. Four months later, he was sentenced to death. In 2018, 11-year-old Angelica Santos, a sixth grader at Washington Middle School, began getting in trouble at school. 
One day, she and the other student who she had been fighting with got into a physical altercation in the lunchroom, and resource officer Elias Wezar broke up the fight. By January of 2019, she had been suspended twice and was served a restraining order to stay away from the other student she had been fighting with. When she returned to school, the problems continued. While she was no longer getting into fights, she was being disruptive, and some days she wouldn't show up at all. Fellow students also began to notice that she was hanging around with the school's resource officer, Elias, who also worked as a police officer for the Yakima Police Department. Some students also informed administrators about the inappropriate comments he was making towards them. The school, believing Elias was just trying to be funny, simply gave him a warning. They also asked him to make his Facebook account private to prevent students from seeing it. However, not long after, school officials also began to notice Angelica often standing with him before school and during lunch. They spoke with Angelica and her grandmother, who she lived with, about it and asked her to stop. However, by March of 2019, Angelica began telling her friends on Snapchat about her relationship with Elias, who was 22 years older than she was. She told people that the two had sex at school and that she was even spending time at his house. She also sent them photos of him shirtless. Eventually, a concerned student went to the school administration to inform them of the comments. The school questioned her, but she denied the allegations. They also spoke with Elias, who said Angelica was making him uncomfortable and he didn't want her hanging around him. Since they couldn't verify any of the things Angelica was saying were true, they let the issue go until more people came forward reporting the same thing. They then turned over the information to the Yakima Police Department. However, since Elias was an officer in the department, they passed all the information to the Washington State's Attorney General's office. During the investigation, he was suspended from his job. When the investigator questioned Angelica's grandmother, she alluded to her granddaughter having a crush on Elias and said all she did was follow him around school, but dismissed claims that it was anything more than that. Plus, she had been told by Angelica that it was all rumors made up by other students. They began to dismiss the claims after fellow students told them that Angelica had a bad habit of fabricating stories. Even the youth director at her church confirmed her habit of lying. He said one time she told everyone that she had a son, but at the time she didn't. When investigators questioned Angelica about the Snapchats, she denied the allegations and said her account had been hacked and she no longer had access to it. Strangely, they never interviewed Elias. Unfortunately, they were unable to confirm the two were having a sexual relationship and no charges were filed. The police department decided to slap him with a policy violation, but never completed it. The school, however, moved him to the Franklin Middle School. While there, he was praised for being an excellent substitute teacher. By September of that year, Elias obtained a protection order against 13-year-old Angelica to keep her away from his wife and their two kids. However, within a year, Elias and his wife, Amber Rodriguez, were involved in a nasty divorce. He had even taken their kids against her wishes and enrolled them in school, and she didn't see them again for three weeks. On March 10, 2021, Elias called the police in Richland, Washington, to report that Amber had forged medical documents. Nine days later, he called again. This time, he wanted to report that a family member was texting a minor. Then, on April 7th, he accused Amber's father of threatening to shoot him. After all the calls, the Richland police notified the Yakima Police Department, where Elias was still employed. He then successfully applied for medical leave for PTSD. However, he continued working at Richland High School, where he recently found employment as a substitute teacher and coach. During that time, he says that he and 15-year-old Angelica began communicating again and eventually started dating. Around a year later, she became pregnant with his child. In April 2023, 16-year-old Angelica gave birth and the two moved in together. In February of 2024, 17-year-old Angelica had one of her friends over and they all began drinking. After both girls passed out, Angelica woke up to find him sexually assaulting her unconscious friend. The friend also woke up during the assault and they both took the child and fled the home. They called the police, who arrived at the home, to find Elias had barricaded himself inside. After three hours, he was arrested and charged with sexual assault. 
He was ordered to stay away from Angelica and her friend, and even his ex-wife, Amber, who said she was terrified of him, took out a restraining order. The investigation into Elias began to ramp up, and they discovered he had a thing for young girls. He had met his ex-wife, Amber, when she was 17, and he was 24. They also learned he was now living in Richland, but still employed as an officer at the Yakima Police Department. When asked why he moved, he said it was to stay close to Amber and his two kids. Then, on February 14, 2022, he quit the department due to all the investigations into him. While Amber didn't want to get involved, she told a Union Gap police detective, who had since taken over the case, that Elias was not of sound mind and described him as a short-tempered, controlling person who regularly heard voices in his head. Then, in April of 2024, with him facing two possible charges of sexual assault, he did the unthinkable. On April 22, 2024, at 3.32 p.m., in front of the school where Amber worked, Elias, dressed all in black, quickly approached her, pulled out a gun, and shot her to death, all in front of their nine-year-old child. He then took Angelica's one-year-old son and fled the state. When officers went to his home to look for him, they found that Angelica had also been shot to death. Officers eventually caught up to him south of Portland on Interstate 5. A miles-long, high-speed chase ensued and ended when Elias crashed his vehicle outside of Eugene, Oregon. Before officers could arrest him, he took his own life. Thankfully, Angelica's one-year-old son was unharmed during the ordeal and returned to Angelica's maternal grandmother, 34-year-old Tiffany Penaloza. It's horrible that Elias caused so much destruction in everyone's lives, but at least he could never hurt anyone ever again. On March 5, 1993, Alabama State Trooper John Clark came upon 12-year-old Daryl Richard Ennis, who went by Rick, walking along the side of the road with a backpack. The officer stopped to pick him up, believing he needed a ride home. Rick then told Clark that he had been driving his family's car and crashed it. He then asked to search his backpack, and he agreed. When Trooper Clark looked inside, he found a kitchen knife, a 12-gauge shotgun, and some loose 22 caliber ammo. At that point, he asked Rick where his parents were. That's when he calmly said that he had shot his mother, Dolly Flowers, and beat her with a baseball bat two days ago. He said when his stepfather, Eddie Joe Flowers, arrived home, he shot him as well. When asked why he did it, he said they were moving, and he was mad at them because of it. After murdering them both on March 3, 1993, he continued going to school for the next two days. After officers arrived at their home and confirmed Rick's story, they began searching and found a to-do list that included killing his three stepsisters. The state of Alabama had all the evidence they needed, arrested him, and charged him with murder. However, due to Alabama law, he was only required to remain in a juvenile detention center until the age of 21. Nine years later, Rick was released and moved to Auburn, Alabama. He then got a job at a bowling alley, and that's where he met Lori Slasinski. To Lori, they were just friends, but Rick became obsessed with her and wanted to take their friendship to the next level. Lori was born on September 21, 1981, and graduated from Auburn University. She then got a job at a local mental health facility with her best friend, Lindsay Braun. On the night of June 10, 2006, Lori planned a girls' night with Lindsay. They planned to hang out, watch a movie, and drink some Rum Runners. Lindsay said that Lori called about 6.30 and said she was stopping to get some drink mixes and then would be on her way. Sadly, Lori would never arrive. 30 minutes later, Lindsay received a call from Lori and quickly answered, but strangely, no one was there. After that night, Lori was never seen or heard from again. When she failed to show up, Lindsay thought she might have gone to a different friend's house instead and went on to bed. The following day, Lindsay began trying to get in touch with Lori, but all her calls were going to voicemail. Lori's mother, Arlene, was also unable to reach her. Lori then failed to show up to work Monday. Lindsay knew that she had been with Rick on Saturday because she heard him in the background during one of their calls. So she sent him a text asking about Lori. He responded that he was sure she was fine. When she failed to show up for work on Tuesday, Lindsay and another co-worker went to her mobile home to check on her. 
When they arrived, they found the door unlocked, the AC on, and her dog Peanut in his crate. It looked to them like someone had been feeding him. She also found three rugs missing from her kitchen, along with a trash can from outside. Meanwhile, their boss at the mental health facility called Arlene to inform her of the disappearance. She immediately began heading to Auburn and called her husband Casey along the way and the Auburn police. When Arlene arrived, she searched the mobile home and found the phone in her daughter's bedroom was missing its cord. As investigators began to look into the case, they were able to get footage from a Walmart surveillance camera that showed Lori made it to the store on the night she disappeared. Four days later, Lori's burnout car was found on a cul-de-sac in a neighborhood that was still under construction. It had basically exploded at 4.40 in the morning and was found engulfed in flames. Interestingly, this area is close to the bowling alley where Rick worked. Investigators also found a gas can in the nearby woods that looked similar to one missing from the bowling alley. When investigators questioned Rick on the day Lori was reported missing, he said that when he saw her, she appeared fine. When they re-questioned him the following day, they noticed scratches on his hands and arms. They also learned about his disturbing past of killing his mother and stepfather. They then questioned him about a love letter that Lori had received before her murder, and he admitted to writing it. When they searched his car, they found a knife, fuzzy handcuffs, and cleaning supplies. Surprisingly, Arlene knew Rick because he spent the previous Christmas with them. Lori allegedly invited him because she said she felt sorry for him since he had no family. However, they were unaware of his past. While they looked at Rick as the primary suspect, they didn't have enough evidence to arrest him. Ten years later, in 2016, Lori's case was chosen as part of a new cold case initiative. The cold case team began pouring through old files and interviews. They also sent evidence off for DNA testing. One piece of evidence was a hand-rolled cigarette that was found next to Lori's burned-out car. To their surprise, the DNA matched Rick's DNA. They also discovered that DNA was checked in 2006 against blood found on the inside of the home and DNA fluid on her sheets, and both also matched to Rick. In a surprising turn of events, one of Rick's former roommates turned over the three missing rugs from Lori's trailer. Her blood was discovered on one of them. At that point, they had enough evidence and arrested him and charged him with Lori's murder in August 2018 at his home in Virginia. Rick had moved away after the murder and met a school librarian, Alana Atkinson, and the two were engaged at the time of his arrest. Sadly, after he was arrested, Arlene's 41-year-old son died from a stroke and cancer. Then, in 2020, her husband, Casey, died after coming down with COVID. After his arrest, a friend of his named Terry Booth came forward and told about a conversation he had with Rick in a bar once. He said he was talking about something that happened in his past and basically said he had to get rid of a bitch. His friend thought it was a joke until he saw his arrest for the murder. During his March 2022 trial, even though his past crimes were not allowed to be brought up by prosecutors, Rick decided to talk about them anyway while on the stand. He blamed the murder of his parents on the fact that his mother was very abusive, a claim that has never been corroborated. He also maintained his innocence in Lori's murder. It's theorized that Rick murdered Lori because she rejected his advances. In the end, he was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison. While this case is considered solved, as of June 2024, Lori has never been found. Leslie Jennings Prier was born on October 5, 1951. In the spring of 2001, 50-year-old Leslie was living in Chevy Chase, Maryland with her husband, Sandy. She had a 24-year-old daughter named Lauren Prier and worked at Specialties Incorporated, an advertising production company in Northwest DC. On May 2, 2001, at 7.45 a.m., Sandy left work before Leslie and would sadly never see her alive again. When she failed to show up to work, a concerned friend and co-worker called Sandy to let him know. Together, they went back to the house and upon entering, strangely found blood in the foyer. As they kept searching the home, they eventually found Leslie's beaten body in the upstairs bedroom and quickly called 911. 
At the time, investigators were baffled, but immediately looked at Sandy as a suspect, especially since there was no forced entry into the home and it didn't appear to be a burglary gone wrong. They also looked at Sandy and Lauren's associates, but could never find a prime suspect. They did, however, have DNA from the crime scene. Unfortunately, the case would still go unsolved for the next 23 years, and when the killer was finally revealed, it would shock the community to its core. In September of 2022, the DNA was sent off to Othram for advanced DNA testing and forensic genetic genealogy. With investigative leads in hand, investigators learned the suspect might be Lauren's ex-boyfriend, Eugene Theodore Gligor, who, as of 2024, is 44 years old. Gligor grew up in the same community as the Priors and dated Lauren when they were just 15 years old. They also ran in the same circle of friends. However, investigators needed to be absolutely sure that he was their man, so they collected some of his belongings for DNA evidence, and lo and behold, it was a match. On June 18th, 2024, Gligor was arrested and charged with first-degree murder. Lauren was shocked and said she never considered Gligor a potential suspect. The two had dated until they were about 20 years old, and four years later, Leslie was murdered. She said in high school, Gligor was very well liked, and he was always very kind and sweet. Since they lived close to each other, they spent a lot of time at each other's homes. He even took trips with the Priors to the Outer Banks and other beach vacations. While everyone in the family adored him, her father, Sandy, always felt something was off about him. She never experienced a violent side to him, but said she knew some of his relatives were quick to temper. During Lauren's second year in college, the long-distance relationship became too much, and they decided to break up. Interestingly, Gligor's name was in the case file after a neighbor called and said they might want to look into him. Even Sandy had raised suspicions about him to investigators. Another neighbor described Gligor to investigators as a troublemaker. While I saw it mentioned that he had a criminal history, I was not able to find what those crimes were. Regardless, it remains unclear why investigators didn't look into him more at the time. When Lauren ran into him years later in a bar in Bethesda, Maryland, he looked at her and replied, I'm so sorry. While he had been super close with the Priors, he was a no-show at Leslie's funeral. However, unbeknownst to many, Gligor had a bad side, and at one point, even his brother became scared of him. In 2021, the brother sent Lauren a text and said he was worried that Gligor was going to harm him. Sadly, Sandy died in 2017 of septic shock without ever learning who murdered his wife. As of June 2024, Eugene remains in jail awaiting trial. In the fall of 1986, 28-year-old William Halpern, who went by Billy, was living in a town home in Miramar, Florida, and working at the former Apollo Gym in Hollywood, Florida. Billy was an avid bodybuilder and former firefighter. He was described as a good person who loved his family. That is, until his life was tragically cut short. On October 21, 1986, Billy's girlfriend arrived home to find him dead. He had been tied up, beaten, and stabbed to death. Investigators received dozens of tips and eventually tied Billy's murder to a double murder around the same time, 20 miles away in Tamarick, Florida. Both crime scenes were very similar. There was no forced entry, a sharp weapon was used, and the victims were tied up in the same fashion using black electrical tape. Unfortunately, they were unable to tie the murders to anyone directly, but they at least had DNA. The owner of the Apollo Gym, Gilbert Fernandez Jr., who was also a former Miami-Dade police officer, immediately became a suspect. The other suspect was Hubert Christie, the manager of the gym. It turns out the gym was a front for sketchy dealings like loan sharking, drugs, and murder for hire, a side of the business that Billy wasn't involved in. In 1991, Fernandez and Christie were both found guilty of a triple murder and sentenced to life in prison. Unfortunately, they couldn't link the men to Billy's murder, and the case would go unsolved for the next 40 years. In January 2024, the case was reopened, and the DNA was sent off for testing. It eventually led them to a man by the name of Harry Van Collier. They now believe that Collier was the shooter, but believe he had help. 
Interestingly, Collier was murdered not long after Billy, and they believe it was all connected back to the Apollo gym. If he were alive today, he would be charged with the murder. In 2000, Christie died in prison at the age of 66. Fernandez, on the other hand, is still alive, serving his life sentence. Both their DNA was excluded from DNA found at the crime scene. Unfortunately, the motive for the murder was that Billy likely saw or heard too much and wouldn't go along with their illegal activities. He was deemed a loose end, and Collier decided to take him out, or he was hired to take him out. The only reason at this point that Billy's case is still open is in case they connect it to other individuals. Otherwise, it is now considered solved. 